So I ended up becoming Nike's first design intern. Spent 25 years there. First 10 were in Nike basketball, 94 to 2004. A lot of people say that that was like the most influential time. My last project was to bring on LeBron. So I designed his shoe, worked with him when he was in high school. I was in Nike Innovation when Born to Run came out, was one of the first way to read the book. I've been in this space of specific foot performance beyond like footwear performance, but foot performance for a long time and, and was actually in Europe when Nike Free was being developed. The original iterations were proven to build foot strength as good as barefoot alone. Welcome to the Restore to Explore podcast from your soulmates at the Foot Collective. We're on a mission to empower humans to restore their natural health and function from the ground up so we can all explore movement and life with freedom and confidence. This week's episode is brought to you by the TFC Soulmate, your ultimate all-in-one restoration and exploration tool. Made from cork, TFC Soulmates are an eco-friendly, lightweight and durable mobility, balance and foot training tool that can be used as a massage roller, foot roller, balance beam, a slant board, and even includes two toe resistance bands. The Soulmate is the perfect companion to mobilize your toes, feet, and ankles, strengthen your lower body, improve balance, posture, and alignment, and prevent and rehab common foot and ankle conditions like plantar fasciitis, bunions, ankle sprains, Achilles tendonitis, and so much more. Every TFC Soulmate comes with access to an in-depth training manual with guided routines from TFC health professionals to make improving foot function and balance fun and accessible for all ages and abilities. For 10% off your soulmate, head to thefootcollective.com and use the code R2E. That's R, the number two, E at checkout. You'll find the details in the show notes. All right, hello friends. Welcome to the Restore to Explore podcast. I'm Nick, and uh, today I have the honor of speaking with Nike footwear design veteran, Aaron Cooper. So Aaron, thanks for being here and offering some of your time for our conversation today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on, Nick. Appreciate it. No worries. And thanks, Link, for uh, coordinating this. Lincoln is the back-end wizard that uh, pairs all these podcasts up. So thanks, Lincoln. Um, so for those who don't know you, Aaron, uh, I'd love to start with just your story. So how you got into the shoe business initially, you know, maybe what what gravitated you to that um, to that work realm. And then I'd love to hear a little bit about your work at Nike and, you know, everything that you sort of worked on or anything of interest that you worked on up until today and where you're at today. So I, um, I know Aaron, um, from sort of past occasions, he actually, uh, showed me around the Nike campus in Portland, which was really fun. And I'm very grateful for that, Aaron, but yeah, for those who don't know you, um, maybe give the people a little bit of background about who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, well, first say, um, I tell a lot of stories, uh, every Sunday at sneaker story Sundays on my Instagram, nice. which is. Aaron.ac.cooper, so at Aaron.ac.cooper. And that has, uh, there is some some backstory of my bigger concept where it came from, um, but uh, but goes into deeper stories around individual projects I've been a part of. And, um, but I started as a, well, if you, how far do you want to go way back? Let's go way. We don't Let's have to go, go into a lot of detail at each step, but I'd love to know the whole continuum yeah, yeah. of like, when did no, you step foot in Nike and how did that even materialize? Yep. Yep. Um, and I, it, it's going to, um, sound funny, but I am going to go all the way back. I like it. It is relevant. My father was a, uh, Episcopal priest. So he's a preacher. My mom was a social activist. So I like to say that empathy was a part of my, not just nature. So my genetics, but also my nurture. So growing up in that house, um, with those parents, uh, I did not necessarily care where um, people came from, what they looked like. My house was open, um, very open. Uh, my father was a very, my father actually hired the first, um, or not hired, but brought in to preach the first uh, female preacher um, within the church uh, where, where we were living in Seattle. Um, and that was in the seventies um, that didn't go over very well uh, with a lot of parishioners, but he didn't care. Um, that's just the type of person he was, um, and my mom being the same. So, so that idea of empathy was, was always with me. Um, and then on the creative end, my mom's side of the family is very creative, um, actually have ancestry that are in, uh, in the, uh, Smithsonian. 
uh, for both photography, needlepoint, illustration, and a lot of different areas. Um, and then my, my other grandfather was um, an Olympic uh, rower. So athletics were also part of my genetics. So all that together, I grew up in a, a very uh, open uh, uh, house, uh, athletics were important. Um, and then creativity was, was also important to me and something I just lived with every day. So all those things, uh, came to fruition and took me to the art center college of design in Pasadena. Uh, and I studied industrial design, then, um, wanted to do two internships. And one of those internships happened to be at Nike, uh, took me about eight months to get it because there was no internship program at the time. So I ended up becoming Nike's first design intern. Cool. Uh, and then one of my goals, one of my other goals uh, was to have a job offer before graduation because I didn't want to go through the, um, you know, the that whole recruiting process and all that stuff. So that was kind of the intent with the internships was to look for places that I thought that I would really love to work full time. So that was um, I kind of, again, just fell into Nike didn't really realize that they had um, a design. I mean, this is 1994. So design wasn't even really in the, a household term, let alone footwear design. Hmm. Uh, but athletics, again, were important to me. My, my, really my purpose path, Nick, was or is, continues to be human performance at the highest level. And then um, doesn't matter to me if it's about on top of the body or inside of the body. Um, on top of the skin, underneath the skin, it's all human performance to me, and that can take in different forms, product services, experiences. Uh, uh, that, that is, that's that, those are the companies that I that I work with. Those are the companies that I um, actually ended up putting together a strategy for Nike to go beyond footwear and apparel um, in the last years of my um, my time there. But so I went from internship, got a job offer before I left. Uh, and I was 94, ended up accepting the job and uh, spent 25 years there. First 10 were in Nike basketball, 94 to 2004. A lot of people say that that was like the most influential time uh, of the industry, um, not just time, but also the, the product and the, the category of product, um, Nike basketball for that to those 10 years. Um, so I was, you know when Jordan was signed with Nike? What year? What year? Uh, I do not 80 something. I don't know. And I, and right. I would, I'd say, uh, people are listening are probably going, Oh, you can just watch the movie air. Not necessarily because about 90% <laughs> of that movie was false. Yeah. It's uh, a movie. It's not a documentary. Yeah. It's, it's entertainment. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so 10 years in Nike basketball, actually speaking of, uh, signing people. So I, my last project was to, um, was to bring on LeBron. So I designed his shoe, worked with him when he was in high school uh, to encourage him, inspire him to sign with Nike, got that done, then left, uh, campus, went, left Beaverton to, uh, start up the footwear design office in Europe. And so moved to Amsterdam with the family, spent three years there, uh, then back, spent a year with the kids team. So, um, was the head of kids footwear design, uh, and then did three years or maybe it was more than that. Um, and, and Nike training, which was maybe the most influential because that's when I really got into um, a deeper level of human performance because the idea of we were going after a business plan and a strategy to, to go after um, to build people's athleticism separate from uh, their sport. So uh, and it was interesting because towards the end, um, it started kind of coming out, but I took that into, um, my work in innovation where this idea of athleticism was starting to be used. You started hearing it, um, like on ESPN, you know, the athleticism of this athlete or the athleticism of that athlete didn't, didn't matter the sport they were playing or in what context they were talking about, but it was, it was about their athleticism before the application of a sports skill. Hmm. And, um, that was very influential, uh, the footwear um, piece was is, I've always approached it as it's it's product, right? It's product design happens to be the form of a of a shoe, um, but you're always trying to find develop a level of empathy with the population you're trying to serve uh, and create the best solution um, and the best design. So design being um, good design is a balance of, of form and function, form following function, and that that symbiotic relationship between art and science. So inspiring somebody to, you know, in this case, purchase the product, 
and then equally that product enabling them to do what it's promised to do. So, um, and, and I actually, um, I was there when, uh, I was in Nike innovation when, um, born to run came out was one of the first, maybe the first in Nike, I don't know, but, um, in our group anyway, to read the book, uh, and then was there when Hoka started where you could only buy it online or at the Boulder running company, bought a pair online, was there when you could only buy, um, uh, the five toed shoes on online, bought those first. Uh, so I've, I've been in this space of a foot specific foot performance beyond like footwear performance, but foot performance, um, for a long time and, and was actually in Europe when Nike free was being developed and was a little bit of a part of that was actually at the university of Cologne when those found findings were revealed by the, by the university. Um, Nike had nothing to do with, with those, um, uh, findings. They just, they listened to them at the same time the media did. It was pretty, pretty remarkable. What uh, were those findings for someone not aware? Uh, so Nike free, uh, the original, um, uh, iterations were proven to build foot strength, uh, as good as barefoot alone. Um, so in a shod, uh, state, um, and your feet are protected so you can go they even uh, proved that it was uh, it was as good as uh, being barefoot throughout the day. So um, you could wear Nike free uh, and walk around and and you would build your foot strength better than not um, mm. or as good as being barefoot, uh, which was remarkable findings, um, pretty staggering findings, to be honest. Um, they actually later um, a lot of Nike running athletes started using this training tools and we're, and we're breaking through, um, uh, plateaus that they had, you know, performance plateaus that they were on for years, um, shattering PRs after doing a, a very prescriptive training regimen with the Nike free. Um, but then quickly the five toes, like all these things started happening and then people getting injured, people wearing Nike free, you know, right away doing long runs, foot pain, blah, blah, blah. And the education just wasn't as strong as it needed to be um, for that to really um, have taken off the way it should have. It became the one, it's, it's still today one of the best selling um, pieces of footwear that's ever been in the industry. Um, Do you think they'll ever bring it back? Because I've always kind of missed well, it. I always kind of wondered. Yeah, you, yeah know. They still have, you can buy Nike free now, but it's okay, not. Interesting. But I will tell you, it's not. Um, it's not as good as the original and I don't, the original was just the beginning. So the original wasn't as good as it, you know, I, I think they, I don't look, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, tied to any brand. I, I'm a big fan of everybody, um, doing the right thing. And like ultra has some, I rent, I just went for a run this morning in my altars. Um, and, uh, they get a lot of slack for, for going in the wrong direction, you know, going towards the direction of, of kind of more, typical footwear industry product. Um, I would say Nike free probably did the same thing. Um, but then I worked, you know, I, I did some work for Vivo for a little while. I've told them, so I'll tell other people, like, I think they, they're falling on a sword that I think doesn't do the rest of us any good. Um, I would In what sense? See, well, I would love to see them. Nobody's built a great bridge and that's what Nike free was supposed to be. The 5.0 was supposed, they were eventually it was going to be built into, you know, let's take Nike Pegasus as a 10.0. The original Nike free for was 5.0. Then they came what out. Is that, what does that number represent? The amount of uh, complexity in the shoe? Uh, it, it was kind of a, um, kind of a number, um, like a non meaningful number. It just was a, um, a number that they applied to it as like, Hey, if, if, if the Pegasus is a 10, meaning, that's just the state of the industry today. That's the state of a running shoe today, like a quintessential everyday running shoe. Um, and Pegasus was one of the best selling. And if we were trying to get to barefoot, which is zero. Gotcha. Then what's in between a five, then they did a seven, then they did a three, they did a one. Um, but that never really came to, it was like, if you know, you know, I mean, if, I mean of all people, Nick, you should have known that. And the fact that you didn't is my, Kind of the, the case in point, right? Yep. Uh, and so, so yeah, I don't think anybody's. I mean, look to to be able to build that out. That's a huge, 
commitment. That's a big brand. Um, but I would love to see someone, um, if not me, like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working on building, uh, building it maybe through other, other ways, but, um, I still don't think the perfect running shoe has been created. Uh, I don't think Nike free was the best, um, for a number of different reasons. And, um, so what are the qualities of the perfect running shoe in your mind? Like if you had to describe it from a high level without getting too deep, what, um, yeah, yeah. I'd love to know your thoughts on that. No, I love it. Um, and if anybody's listening and they, uh, if they want to do this, um, reach out to me because, uh, well, I'm currently doing it for some others, but whether or not it ends up happening is, you know, I mean, look at, again, Alter is a great, a great example, but, but I think, uh, every, you know, every, the last comes first. So the form that, uh, footwear is created on, um, comes first. I think Vivo's got probably the best in the industry. Um, but even their last iteration, their newest iteration of, uh, is, I believe has gone too far, um, to, uh, to a true barefoot, um, and, and their last, the last before that was a little bit more, um, digestible, I guess, um, it, it, people there's, there, there, to back up a little bit from, um, human behavior is tough to change. People like something that tastes good feels good, looks good, right? If there's anything outside of that, then you need some pretty provocative uh, and in influential and inspirational marketing to to uh, to alter those behaviors. So, you know, good reason why, you know, people like to eat candy and not broccoli, right? Um, broccoli needs a, you know, a good marketing campaign <laughs> at some point. Yeah, the broccoli uh, marketing committee is uh, not very creative. Exactly. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so it starts with the last. So I, I think there's, there's a, um, the, um, one of the for earlier, uh, Vivo last, uh, definitely is, is I think the best. Um, so, so out of everything that's out there, I would start there. Then, um, look, there's no, I do believe in, um, uh, being born to run, but that was back when there was no asphalt. Asphalt wasn't invented. Concrete certainly wasn't invented. Um, and so, you know, if your listeners are really true to themselves right now, if you're living in New York or LA, how far do you have to run or walk to find a natural piece of earth, mother earth? Um, not something that, 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 uh, humans have brought in, but just true, you know, if you were to dig, start digging, you would never reach anything, um, man-made like it's, it's the original mother earth. And once you find it, how far can you walk on it or run on, on it? Probably pretty difficult. So, so there needs to be some level of augmentation to balance out that, um, to balance out that, that surface. So we were not born to run on asphalt. Right. Well, so sometimes I agree. I don't disagree with that statement. I also think that we have the capacity if we have the right baseline conditioning to run on hard surfaces, like arid soil, it's pretty damn hard, but you need a body that's tuned to be able to adapt to that and able to actually absorb those impact forces. And the reality is if people are used to walking around on a mattress or an air bubble, their bodies don't actually know how to, how to absorb and recycle energy from a hard surface. So while I think the majority of people aren't, aren't ready for that right now, and maybe even to the foreseeable future, I think it can be done. It's just. Like you said, it's, I think extremes on both end are not good. And there's also just the straight up reality that most people's bodies do not reflect the kind of body of people who, who are born to run, who are sitting on the ground, who are walking most of the day, who are not sitting in chairs all day, who are not wearing footwear that essentially decondition radically deconditions their feet. So I agree. I think there is, it's almost like the perfect shoe is a continuum of options where people can navigate from one side, which is like. I'm deconditioned. I'm used to a really maximalist shoe all the way gradually to a very minimal shoe, which they might use for certain runs, maybe all the runs, maybe they don't use it for competition, but at least have the optionality. And I think the thing that's missing in my mind is people don't have the understanding of their feet and how to self-regulate their bodies to actually make good decisions about trade-offs being made along that continuum, because it's not, you should be here or you should be here. It's well, 
you should be wherever you are right now based on wherever you want to go and what your training is like. And that, that's a lot of like nuance to put in there. And I think 100%. what we're trying to do at TFC is empower people with the understanding so they can make those choices. Yes. So uh, that's the education piece. And uh, the trouble, again, with human behavior and our lives today, at least in the U.S., um, most of us don't have time to spare. Time and money, right? We don't have it to spare, most of us. Um, and so, and then there's, you know, what do you, so if you do have 30 minutes, what do you do with those 30 minutes, right? And if you, if you have decided that you want to make an effort to become a healthier human being uh, and you have 30 minutes to a day to dedicate to that, or let's just say an hour, right? To go to the gym. Somebody's inspired you to go to the gym for an hour. What do you do during that hour? Um, most people want to see a pretty quick outcome. That's another thing about human, be you know, human beings. We want to see, we want, we want, you know, fast satisfaction. Instant results. Right. Instant results. Uh, and so starting with the feet and doing foot exercises or even full body exercises that, that help, um, you know, uh, foot health that then help, you know, the rest of the kinetic chain, you know, to fire properly and, and, and to, like you said, to get to that point where you can, um, physically, uh, take on the, the, the load and impact of, um, of asphalt running. Uh, that's a, t that's a tough, that's a long journey and a tough ask. And so yeah. that's why, um, that's why I would start with the product. Uh, and so I would start with, and that's why out of all the shoes that I've found alters my, um, the one shoe that I think is the, the best starting point, the, uh, the Torin. And by the way, they, I'm on the, I'm on the five. I had to buy multiple pairs because the, the six and seven, I'm not, not big fan of for different reasons. So, some things that just, if anyone's from Alters listening, just call me. I'll give you like, give you some free <laughs> advice. Get like, the Aaron Cooper download, design download. Oh my God. I could help so many. I could, I look at retail. I'm like, you just tweak a couple little things that don't cost any money and it'll make it a better shoe, better, you know, experience. But anyway, um, so that's where I would start. I would start with something that, uh, and there's different foams now that, um, so I, I would I would go back to the basically the Nike free mod business model and start business the the product strategy, and start there. I'd build a 5.0, and Nike free wouldn't be where I would I would start with that concept, but not how they how it ended up. Um, and it wouldn't be about getting barefoot on grass. I just want to create a better experience for people so that they walk around every day wearing something that is actually helpful. I I, I wear um, Vivo. There's just the, um, the, the, what's it called? The boot, the, um, blanket on the name of it, but, uh, that's what I wear every day. So I'm trying to condition my feet, um, so that when I do go for runs and I did, and I, and I, so I wear the ultra and then I did a half marathon and I wore the, uh, um, new balance rebel don't love the last, but I can't wear, um, I can't wear a sock and endorphin three or four, um, I can't wear that last. I probably would have worn that shoe for a, 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 a half marathon because it actually, has, you know, I think it's um, uh, an eight millimeter offset. I think the, the uh, um, sorry, I'm blanking. Uh, the New Balance Rebel six, I think six, four to six is probably good for, you know, half marathon. That's the other thing. Human, humans weren't, we were born to run, you know, way back in the day. So, so say let's let the body is, we were born to run and let's just say we maintained that physiology into our forties, uh, which most of us don't, we start sitting in kindergarten and we don't, and, and we never get up until our you know, late twenties and we will start running again <laughs> and uh, start running again. And that's when we get injured. But let's just say that we, we maintain that um, into our twenties, thirties, when we start running again, uh, then, um, then I, I think having, uh, you know, a proper fitting upper, having a, you know, a four to six millimeter offset, uh, because that the longer period of run, we're not born for, we're, we're born for, um, you know, more steady runs, but take a break, more steady run, take a break, not fast, kind of call it like, there's a lot of things that we were born to do 
that we aren't typically practicing today. Um, and so all of that has to be considered into a product. We wanted to take a quick break from the episode to let you know about our ultimate free foot health resource. If you're listening, you've probably already started the journey towards improving your foot and movement health. But if you're still wearing conventional shoes most of the time, that's anything cushioned, heeled, narrow or rigid, it's kind of like taking one step forward and two steps back. Knowing what shoe is right for you though can be super confusing. That's why we made the Guide to Foot Freedom. We've taken everything our team of foot health experts have learned over the years and synthesized it into one handy manual, packed with all you need to know about unleashing the natural power of your foundation. You'll learn how to understand your feet, the truth about modern footwear, the five F's for finding natural footwear, plus a step-by-step -step guide with training videos to help you assess your foot function and improve it so you can safely and seamlessly transition into shoes that will finally give your feet freedom. The best part is, like I said, it's absolutely free. Just head to thefootcollective.com and click learn to find the free ebook, The Guide to Foot Freedom. You'll find the link in the show notes. Now back to the episode. Designing a product as fundamental as footwear uh, is definitely a challenge considering the people that are gonna be wearing that footwear very widely in terms of their ability, how, shape, how their feet are shaped, how they actually move. You know, one of the interesting things I find being in a shoe business here in Canada with Soul Freedom is you get all these people coming in with different wear patterns of their shoes. And the instant thing they wanna say is, well, the shoe's flawed, look, look at this wear pattern. And a lot of times you just have to break it down. Like, well, how you move determines how that shoe interacts with the ground. Mm -hmm. And if your body is not moving efficiently, um, the shoe wear pattern at the bottom on the sole actually just gives you an insight as to how you're moving inefficiently. Um, one of my favorites was a mother came back. She had her kid had bought a pair of shoes. She brings the two shoes back. One of the soles is completely, completely worn out, no tread, almost to the foot. And the other one's fine. And I'm like, and she's like, yeah, there must be a flaw in the sole material. On the I same look at it, I'm like, I'm like, what is your son doing these? And she's like, oh, he drives a scooter all the time. Oh. I'm like, so that's his brake. And that's his <laughs> plant foot. I don't think it's a problem with the shoe. And, you know, that's just like in the, in the limit. That's an example of, of how easy it is to say, well, it's a problem with the shoe. When in reality, a lot of uh, how the shoe wears over time has to do with our own body mechanics. And I think people are just radically disconnected from how they move because they really just don't move, right? They yep. wear shoes that don't let their feet move. They sit in chairs that don't let their bodies move. And I think saying the human biology uh, is capable of something, like that we have the raw genetics to be able to do something versus saying what we're capable of doing right now really has to do with how we've treated our body and how we've used our body and how it's adapted is way more important. It's like, yeah, you can get to that point, but it takes a lot of adaptation cycles to change from where you are now to where you want to be. No doubt. And, and no shoe is going to do that for you. There's probably a different shoe for each phase of your journey. And, you know, that's just a more complex calculation than just saying, what's the best shoe for me? Again, instant gratification. What's the best shoe for me? I want to run. It's like, well, it takes a lot more information than that to actually pinpoint the right shoe for you right now. For sure. Um, you know, what's crazy. Have you ever, uh, have you ever run behind somebody wearing like a, a normal person <laughs> like wearing a, a uh, one of the super shoes? So, you know, let's call it like the Nike Vapor, the 4% Vapor Fly or whatever they call it. Have you ever? I haven't. Uh, next time, like if you want to see, um, well, you might freak it. Like it, it's grotesque. <laughs> like it's because a lot of people like they're not built for that. Um, people don't understand that that shoe is literally built for one person on the planet. Yeah. One human. Chogi and no one and to else. Do only one thing. Yeah. To break two hour marathon mark. Yes. One person to do one thing. But and it's so else? romantic to think that I'll run like Kipchoge if I buy a shoe. Oh, if you saw me watch him run, he's beautiful. Like he's like I could watch him run all day long. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's very elegant. Very elegant. Beautiful. Great. Amazing word. Exactly. Uh, very elegant runner. Very elegant human like it's, in, it's gorgeous. but he's a unicorn uh, in terms of his movement patterns like 100%. no one else and just, yeah do you know what he uses for to train in probably not that you almost were exactly right probably nothing, nothing. probably nothing and get and actually probably a more truthful right. thing guess what he trained most of his life in no that's what probably, i'm saying he, probably nothing. nothing yeah 
Exactly. So, and that's you what you know why Jamaica is an epicenter for speed. Go over there barefoot. and look, watch kids play. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes I take a step back and I just realize how simple it actually is. Like we're so right now, I'm working on developing a foot health protocol. And the goal is to create like an academic style paper that's readable by the individual, but also in depth enough so that professional or even the company building products around feet can look at that and say, okay, these are the fundamental laws of biology we need to abide by because it does our opinion really just like physics, our opinion doesn't matter. The laws of physics and the laws of biology are really, those are, those are what matter. Everything else is an opinion. We should probably anchor our approach around the things we know for sure to be true. And it seems like that's kind of been something we haven't really paid attention to, but the goal is to just simplify things. You know, it's like, we can go through all these phases of complexity of like, this is the best foot exercise, or this is the best routine. It's like, at the end of the day, just take your shoes off and walk on varied surfaces. Like that's the best way to recondition your feet. You don't need to do all these fancy exercises and tools. Um, and if you are going to wear shoes, just wear shoes that don't mess your feet up. Like literally people get so into the weeds with footwear and you can go deep in terms of features of shoes that respect your feet. But at the end of the day, just literally buy shoes that don't actively damage your feet and your foot health will improve for the same reason that if you're constantly smashing your finger with a hammer every day and your finger hurts, if you stop smashing your finger, your finger will feel better. Not because you did anything extra because you stopped doing the thing that was causing the problem. And it's, you know, I'd love to hear your take on this. It seems like most of the existence of footwear, at least in the, I would say modern era, like maybe in the past 40 years has adopted a last that actually doesn't reflect the shape of a natural human foot. And I'd love to hear your take on why you think that is, um, you know, is it just the status quo of this is how it's been done? So this is how we're going to continue to do it. Or cause clearly these shoe companies are not like, we're going to damage people's feet on purpose. Like, I don't think that's the case, but I would love to know where is the, uh, hurdle that's actually stopping shoe companies from moving forward into a, you know, a human centric footwear design era, because it seems like we're still stuck in the, in the dark ages, you see companies doing it different and doing it better. But it still seems like the biggest players simply haven't um, evolved yet. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on why that is. Yeah, so a few reasons. So in the work that I did, um, so I did a a project called, um, internally it was called Nike Natural. Never, I ended up doing a training shoe, recovery shoe, even an an American um, football cleat. Never saw the light of day, but... um, Phil Knight wanted four pairs of the recovery shoe, uh, athletes all over the world wanted the training shoes, uh, training shoe. Um, it was a Dominican Sioux wore the cleat. Like it was an amazing project. Long story of why I think it never came to fruition. But, um, so in that work, I, I, I tried to dig as deep as I possibly could. And, and a couple things came up, um, for the, the offset. So a higher stack in the heel, um, two places that I found it one far, like, very far back to the Roman uh, times, um, it was a, uh, so if, if you were somebody of wealth, you could have footwear made for you. Um, and so to give you a, a higher, a taller stature, um, then you would have a higher heel stack height to, to make you taller than anybody else. Same thing in the Victorian uh, era to the point where people who were the, in the highest echelon couldn't even walk without assistance because their shoes were so wonky. Like how, how funny is that? If you go to the extreme. <laughs> Well, so yeah, so that was, so in the Victorian, some, the other uh, piece of that was, uh, that I found, um, was around stirrups. So the heel would stop, um, your foot slipping through the uh, stirrups of a, of a, a horse while you're riding your horse. Um, so that was another, another one. Uh, and then, um, and then as the modern footwear came, uh, you know, people walking and you, you know, when you walk your heel, you know, you are, you are a heel striker. Uh, and so giving more, uh, comfort underneath the heel, um, and then a faster toe off, like it just became kind of the, the, you know, uh, the way things were designed. And then, um, you know, company like Nike air came out, Asics gel, you know, whatever the particular companies, you know, um, uh, cushioning, like they fit that underneath, underneath the heel. Uh, and, and it just kind of happened. So part, so what you're also talking about of like what, how it also came, you know, it was done before. So that's the way it's done today. That just kind of kept on happening. So I, 
I was one and I still am. I, you know, I may know a lot about something, but whenever I start a new project, I, I start as if I know nothing. Uh, so I question everything. And so I was questioning everything and, and digging into manufacturing, you know, why is there, you know, anywhere between seven and 14 millimeters of uh, added length to um, from the tip of your toe to the end of the last? Um, why is there a rocker at the bottom of a last? Why is there the offset? Why is there, you know, blah, 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 all these different. And it just, a lot of them came down to um, like toe spring is another one came down to that's the way it was done then. So that's the way it's done now. But some of the things that the reason why it was done then had since changed, mm. but the last itself didn't change with it. And so I just started over. I said, well, if I wanted to create a piece of footwear actually in a, in a system, so a training shoe, recovery shoe in, in athletic, you know, augmented sports shoes, my foot doesn't change form when I slip those shoes on. So I want it to fit and feel the same. I've never worked with a, uh, a global football player that said, yeah, I want my soccer cleat, my global football cleat to, to fit loose. Nobody said like, I want it to be sloppy, right? But they want it to be tight. They want it to be a second skin. They, the only problem they're trying to solve is protection from the ball protection from other cleats and having the traction underneath their foot. So those are the yes. only two augmentations right so other than that there's kids that come out of favelas in brazil or other other places in um in countries where they do grow up bare playing barefooted they make it to the top levels of 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 the sport and they almost have to relearn how to play wearing cleats because it's so foreign to them right and the only thing they need uh, is, is traction on the bottom of their foot and protection around their foot. So it's, it's so crazy that we force the human into the unnatural shoe instead of making a shoe for the human. That, and again, that's just the way, because it's done with the same materials, the same, whatever, like blah, 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 like all, all you have to break it all down. You have to start from scratch. And so that's yep. essentially what I did. I made it a foot form, um, that, that, that was good for training. I did tweak, I, I tweaked the last for American football because it needs to be yep. right. But is it a better foot form for American football than what we currently use? Well, I think so. And it was actually proven in the lab um, and proven by Indominus Sue, one of the best American football players in the game. Um, so I felt like I was heading in the right direction. Aesthetically, did it have uh, a bit of a um, question mark to it? Yes. But my, my belief, and this was pre COVID, my belief was that kids, as, as people are getting more and more used to looking down and seeing a, a natural shaped form, either their barefoot or their Birkenstock, right? Like kid now Birkenstock is now public and it's huge multi-billion dollar company and kids wear them a lot. Uh, I would say even Uggs, even though it's just kind of a, a kind of a general form. Um, it's at least not a narrow, you know, pointy running shoe form, yeah. um, Crocs, all of these help our, our behavior of tilting our head down to look at our something on the, on the ground and seeing something more human. Yeah. It's shifting right? the Overton window of what people think is acceptable. And I think until we actually appreciate the beauty of the natural human form, like the natural foot, once we appreciate that that is actually a beautiful, acceptable form, only at that point will we actually accept that form in the shoes that we wear. Here's, and it seems like we're getting a, there, but we're not there. Here's a crazy one. So when I developed this, this uh, Nike natural in the last that I created, every season Nike does like these huge build outs um, for internal and actually to bring in external people like, and they're insane. I mean, it's like all, all the new Nike stuff, all the future things that are being worked on, all the new design, like stories. It's an amazing, like people would pay a shit ton of money just to walk in that room, I would bet you. Uh, it's incredible. And they do this every season. Uh, and that last was put into uh, that room and they were walking around uh, the editor, editor from uh, Vogue. And in the design manager, you know, the people showing around, showing people around asked, you know, what were things that stood out? And she said, she pointed out that her favorite thing in the entire room, I mean, this is 
oh, this is a, a like a convention center size room. Um, and she said that her favorite thing in the entire uh, place, which she thought was the most beautiful, was that actual last. Fascinating. And this is during a time when people, I didn't know how it made it in there because I was getting so much pushback internally about, um, about the project in general. Uh, because it was like one reason why it didn't get the light of day, why it didn't, you know, survive. What, what do you that? think it is? Like if you had to pick one reason why Nike natural didn't actually make it to the next step, yeah, what do you easy. think that reason is? It's easy. Uh, and, and I might not approve it either. If I were the head of, if I, if, if I owned the business of one of the categories of let's just do, let's just keep down on the running path. Like if you, if you owned the multi-billion dollar business of Nike running and you had, let's just make it easy. You have, you have 10 projects you can put on the wall, right? And those projects have to have to grow your business. Right. And those 10 projects have been building the business since before you got there. Are you going to take one of those projects off the wall and replace it with this thing that nobody knows? You have no idea. It could, it could, you know, it could sell am amazingly well or it could not sell at all. What You're are you doing? the wrong do? person. <laughs> no, I'm not. Think about it. You are rewarded. You are told this is your job. Like that's what you get paid for. And if your business goes down, you're fired. I would risk, I mean, if I, come on, Nick, big caveat, if I knew what I know now and I have the same conviction that it, like my belief is that humans will eventually learn the truth about feed and footwear. Oh, I'm not I, saying I it's going to be tomorrow. I'm just saying the way the business, I'm just being, making it very simple, Nick. Yep. You run the business, right? 10 projects, yep. grow the business. You know what those 10 projects have been. You know what they need to be to grow the business. The risk of taking one of those down and putting a new one up and knowing that that new one, nobody's ever like, okay, maybe there's a, you know, a little bubbling of, of a groundswell that might happen with this kind of natural fitting foot, you know, feeling product. Like the way the business is set up today doesn't allow for those things to happen. Yeah. It rewards status quo and the career risk of a C-suite executive. 100%. outside of the bounds of typical decisions is clearly yes. a disincentive. Yes. And so, someone's going to do it and they're going to crush. That's the thing. And, and when that happens, Nike is one of the better, maybe the best second movers on the planet. Yeah. I wouldn't Their like second that. move will be powerful. Right. But a company and, like that will not be the first mover. And I, I don't, and the one, the one complexity here is, and I've thought about this often, is the idea that when you create a shoe, say you create a free, you come out with a free 1.0 and say, this is an abnormal shoe. Most people aren't going to buy it, but for the people who want a, a fully natural shoe that protects their, the only adaptation they seek is protection and nothing else. Your entire marketing campaign of education for that shoe will indirectly cannibalize all of your other shoes. That's the one it's like, okay, well, back to your example, not, there's well, 10 projects. If the one that you put on the wall that's different is going to have a consequence for the other nine, because everything you say about that is implicitly going to talk shit about all the other things, you know, whether you like it or not, it's a different trade off. So yeah, it's a I big bet. Yeah. Well, the way, the way the company was set up before when Nike free came out. So Nike free in Europe was exactly that. Like it was very scientific. It was very, it was an amazing campaign. Um, and it was doing just, you know, it, it did really well. Um, you know, Nike tends to get off things too quickly in my mind, in my point of view, but, um, but at the end of the day, it was still one of the best selling shoes in the industry, in the history of the industry, still, still today. Wow. Um, and I just think the education back to the educational piece, um, just wasn't there the way the company's set up currently, uh, it's not there, but, um, but the opportunity certainly still is, um, and, and I would never bet against Nike. Um, and, and I'm always cheering for, for Nike. Um, it just, you asked why, why it didn't succeed or why, you know, it's just other it's things a business decision. put in place. Yeah. It's a business decision. And Nike, if you're listening and you want the education piece, TFC is happy to help and you can crush <laughs> with the natural shoe. 
And yeah. eventually, I mean, it's it, the way I look at it, it's, in a, it's an inevitability. It's more just a matter of timing. And I think the cultural window for what people think is acceptable. And, you know, part of the hope of this foot protocol is empowering the end consumer to then be able to express what they want to big companies, right? Like, I don't think Nike's not going to change because of any health professional or any academic paper. They will change when a bunch of their customers say, hey, we don't want that shoe. We want something like this because now we're learning how the foot works and we actually want footwear that enhances our foot function instead of inhibiting it. And when enough customers come to Nike and say, we want this, then the business, then the strictly business decision, which I understand Nike's a business, they have a, you know, they're, they have to honor shareholders and build shareholder value. And if the decision tree has that as the priority, well, there's no reason to actually pivot a major product line until you know that the people who are buying your product want it. And then it becomes a good decision for shareholder value. And at that point, the people who are going to do it probably the best of everyone, I would say is Nike because they have the infrastructure, they have the genetics of creative, beautiful design. They just haven't allowed that seed to bloom yet because frankly, I don't think they know it's important enough yet, but I think it's, it's coming. Yeah. I mean, I, when we see they, I mean, there's certainly people at the company that do know that it's important. So that's why they created Nike free. Yep. Um, but, uh, but they need needs to include, you know, all the way up to the CEO. Yep. Who's the CEO right now? Uh, John Donahoe. Cool. John, get it done. It could be your legacy, yeah. bro. Yeah. His, his, his point of view is just different. You know, he's being rewarded for different things and, and yep. you see that as a reflection. Yep. It's a whole different beast. When you get to that scale, it's just not a simplistic decision. Yeah. It's a, uh, more about dealing with boardrooms and um, shareholder value than it is about probably the product level, but I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, yeah. I look at it just the, op the exact opposite. If you, if you truly listen to the population you're trying to serve with an, with an empathetic, like if you truly find empathy with that population and create what, they're, what they didn't think was possible and didn't even know what they needed, um, all, all of the, the financials will follow. But if you go after from a financial end first um, and you don't necessarily uh, give, you don't necessarily create uh, and the empathy, you know, you don't necessarily create through the, that empathy, you may strike a, a fad. Um, but once that fad is over, you'll wonder what happened to the business. Yeah, maybe that's why they change quickly because they're, you know, it's almost like, if you do it from the money side, it's almost like the tail wagging the dog. And then you're just trying to chase whatever thing yeah. you think you can monetize instead of actually being really grounded in like a, a product philosophy that might be slow to kind of pick up, but will end up paying dividends over the long enough run. Yeah. But in the business cycle, the long run decision making maybe isn't priority. Yeah. I'd love to know if John came to you tomorrow and said, Aaron, we want to do a naturals line. How do you like? And, but you only get to create two products. What would you create? Uh, we create an everyday shoe for sure. Uh, and I would create, I would create a, uh, a global, I would find the premier league player that has been training, grew up playing barefooted and continues to train in the gym and off the pitch barefooted. Um, and is then forced to jam his beautiful foot into a, shitty formed cleat yep. um, because I believe that uh, in partnership with him or her, um, we could change the industry pretty, pretty quickly. I agree. Because that's part of it, right? It's, it's influence. Yep. Uh, like, like I said, in the very beginning, human behavior is hard to change. We all want something that tastes good, looks good and feels good. Right. So anything outside of that, uh, we need some marketing in what you call it influencer marketing, calling in, you know, marketing of influence, inspirational marketing, whatever, however you want to define it, but it's st still marketing at the end of the day to yep. inspire and influence others to follow. Um, I think the beauty like with, with a natural footwear line is that like the really radical alignment I see is your marketing is education and that's kind of cool. Right. Like when you're when your marketing revolves around you educating people about how their bodies work and how to take care of themselves and your product just happens to be a tool that can allow them that can empower them to do that. 
it's a different kind of marketing, right? It's no longer product centric, um, product focused marketing. It's actually just human body and health focused marketing. And then you're providing a product to allow people to actually apply that education. That's my favorite part about working at soul freedom is like, we actually don't market products. We market foot health. And then we provide the products that support people being able to achieve that. And I think that's just fundamentally a different, um, way of thinking than just traditional product marketing. So are you guys creating your own footwear? No, we're just trying our value we offer is focus on the education and then curate all the awesome brands that are creating great products. Oh yeah. I see. Because we just have limited resources and we, we actually tried making a shoe. We had a couple skunk works projects at TFC back in the day where we yeah. did a set of 3d printed lasts that shoe companies could purchase and use in their footwear. Um, and we also tried making a shoe like we made this called the FC 0.5. It was like this very water shoe like shoe. And it was like the first iteration, hopefully of many. But what I learned is it's a very resource and capital intensive endeavor to make a shoe that actually um, evolves and does well. And the last were just they didn't you know, lift off velocity to actually have companies want to buy the last just too big of a yeah. hurdle. It was probably a timing That's thing. Yeah. The other problem is, um, I mean, look at these price points. You can't like, like, you know, Vivo continues to raise their prices and I get it, but, um, you know, and, and so to answer, continue to answer your question about if Donahoe asked me that everyday shoe would be, um, it wouldn't cost much. And then, and then the, uh, the, uh, football, um, cleat. American football cleat would be, or the global football cleat would be at the same cost and performance as, you know, a mercurial. It wouldn't cost more. That's for sure. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I like how you put cleat in there because that is an everyday shoe clearly is like a tool for health. Mm -hmm. Um, that could be your marketing, right. And like, even just the idea that insurance companies that are forking out all this money for people dealing with foot problems, it's like, why wouldn't they cover a shoe that allows people to restore their own feet just by walking, totally. you know, all of a sudden it's not a fashion thing. It's actually like a health tool. Um, you know, the big market we're going after at soul freedom is just educating health professionals. Like why doesn't every personal trainer, yoga instructor, doctor, Cairo physio know to mention to each patient that they should stop wearing shoes that damage their feet. Cause it's literally, it, we're that early in the cultural awareness of feet. And I think it's just partially like out of sight, out of mind. People wear shoes yeah. all the time. They forget they have feet. And, yeah, and I, I know, yeah. and, and trust me, I don't mind. Like I, I know, um, somebody who practices what we're preaching and, and maybe even preach more loudly than even you do. And she wears high heels from time to time. That's confusing. It's not though. That's what like. But she know, but she's she may spend more time during the day uh, with her foot health and certainly with her full body health than than you, you do than anybody. True. Like, so, so she's she, just making a trade off. Yeah, for the for the two or three hours that she wears them, you know, and when she gets to where she goes, or you know, if she's at where, wherever, it's like she understands the the ecosystem of of, of performance and 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 her, you know, desired aesthetics. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I don't, Hoka's may be the worst running shoe you could possibly buy to run in. They may <laughs> actually be worse than barefoot running, honestly. Long-term health, uh, because they don't, um, you create, it's already proven you create more force wearing them, little known fact, and you aren't producing the force back into your, uh, body that your body literally lives on. Yeah. You're manipulating so it's, it's, ground signals and you're, so you're bleeding energy. And so that they, they are the worst. However, I will high five anybody that goes into a running store to buy them. If that means they're going to keep running and stay healthy, as long as they're educated, like, Hey, go, go do your 30 minute run. And then when you get home, take them off where it walk, bare, you know, be barefooted around the house. And then when you go out through the rest of your day, wear a pair of Vivos or wear a pair of whatever, like limbs or what, I don't know, like whatever helps you maintain your barefoot 
in what, when you're at work, roll your feet out while you're on, typing on your computer, like do whatever, like it's the whole system. Yeah. So your daily drivers, the shoes you wear most frequently are the, have a disproportionate impact on your foot health. So if you, if you have your daily drivers on lock and they are natural and they respect your feet, it gives you a bigger cushion to be able to wear shoes that aren't good for your feet because the majority of your time is pushing you in the direction of more foot function. Yeah. Um, and again, it's just the education. It's like the rate limiting step in this actually gaining mainstream adoption in terms of like natural footwear. It's just an awareness piece. And if we can get the health pros to be, to understand it better, if we can get a couple, you know, franchise athletes to like acknowledge the importance of the feed and actually, you know, look at getting, and there's already some people kind of doing this, like Chad, um, used to work at Jordan. Chad, he Chad little, yeah. Chad little. Yeah. So he's working on 3d printed, um, cleats. And I think he has an NFL player or two that are actually trying them and wearing them. And, you know, it just takes, it, it takes the courageous people to actually like try something radically new and know that there's, you know, the, the money side is the biggest conflict, right? It's like right now you can choose to get as an athlete, you can choose, get, choose to get paid lots of money for this potentially short career where you have to monetize your body's ability to wear a certain cleat that, you know, might be damaging your foot, might not feel great, but you can also wear a healthier cleat and get paid nothing. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying I know which choice they should make, but I think right now there's not enough awareness of the importance of foot health for them to actually have an accurate trade-off to be like, you know what? I acknowledge this might have a foot health consequence, but right now my, my focus is more about making income because my career might only be a couple of years. I don't know, but yeah. I don't know if they're actually doing the right math because if they knew how, like if someone's foot gets messed up, their career's over anyway, if it gets seriously messed up, they may never be the same athlete again. So I think it's, again, it's back to this time preference of, do you care about the short term or do you care about the long term? And are we even acknowledging the long term consequences of damaging our feet? And I think over time, it's just hopefully the awareness of that goes up. Um, and I think it is, but it just takes time. Like you said, the Overton window for what people are willing to accept is the limiting factor in human psychology. But, uh, you know, people like yourself or any, any company making natural footwear, I think is contributing to this, you know, put pushing the things forward to bring us towards more awareness of the body. And it's like clothing had this movement, the athleisure movement of people saying, wow, I can actually wear just like gym tights to the coffee shop now because they feel better and seems to be culturally accepted before yeah. then it was like, you got to wear shit that doesn't allow you to really move. I think shoes are like lagging behind, but I also think they're coming. They're just slow. They're just a little bit slower because footwear is such a behemoth in the world of fashion. Yeah. So agreed. What are you most, last thing before we sign off, what are you most excited about? That could be a project or an idea, anything related to foot health and footwear. Um, what are you most excited about today? Uh, well, I'm in San Clemente right now, um, working on a, a, a few projects actually, but, uh, but yeah, some things that I'm working on now. I mean, I, I have a basketball shoe dropping, um, actually quite a few, uh, through this year with a, a Chinese brand. Um, they're amazing, uh, super cool people and um, what they're trying to create, just building the culture of the game. Um, so it's not a, not the perfect last, but it's a better last. It's not the perfect shoe, but it's a better shoe. Um, Which I and, think is actually the goal. It's not, the perfect is oh, like yeah, this no, nebulous I'm, thing. I'm doing what I'm, yeah, I'm doing what I can to sneak the, yeah. you know, yeah. So, um, and then, uh, yeah. And so even with that brand doing some other things that will kind of sneak us even a little further and closer to where I'd like to see people going. Um, I have another, I have a kind of a recovery, I have a, a mule and a three strap sandal that's coming out, um, with, uh, a company called Portland gear. Um, that's coming out in a couple months. Um, those, those are also, you know, if you were to have them, you'd be like, wait, I don't get it. This isn't what you were talking about. But if, but if I shared you my bigger vision in mind, um, then you might. And so, you know, I'm trying to create, I guess, the Trojan horses of the industry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's what these are. And, um, in fact, the, 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 uh, last that I used that I will, that I created, um, that I designed, uh, for the, the mule in this, in the sandal, there's, it's the same last. 
it's actually better than Birkenstock because Birkenstock, some people can't wear them because their second or third toe is longer than their first. And so those foot form last that everybody, a lot, lot of companies are doing, they're also not great because they're not considering all foot forms. Right. So, um, so I'm also doing that cause I've studied a lot of feet and, um, uh, I even have an insult, uh, company that I'm a part of. Um, so of all things insoles, right? Like not you would, again, would think that I wouldn't do imagine doing something like that, but I think insoles are a Trojan horse to, um, to getting people because it's education, right? So the people that are buying our insoles are at least now educated about why insoles are better for them. Um, in the performance shoes that they're putting them in. Um, and then, and then those insoles could then lead us to footwear that then people at least listen to and, and consider, you know, but cool. if they don't have that education first, um, it's a tough, a tough one, but. Well, thanks for continuing yeah. to make your mark in the design space with uh, foot centric design. Cause I think, like you said, you gotta, you kinda gotta slip in a little thing. It's like, the shift is slow and these small iterative changes eventually compound into these big frame shifts in terms of how we think of and design shoes. And, uh, yeah, it's just cool to see any project that is trying to be better. Uh, I'm all for, I'm, uh, really not a super hypercritical person. I have my own opinions of what a natural shoe looks like in the limit. And that might be what I prefer, but I assume it's not what most prefer. And there just needs to be more options, better options, and as you said, education is the linchpin. And I think as education goes up, number of healthy products will also go up. And that's just the way that the product world works until the demand is there and people are ready for it. There's no reason to make it, um, and actually run a viable business. And, uh, and again, I'm super keen for Nike making the second, second mover move and maybe making one of the best natural shoes out there. Uh, if, and when the time comes, I think it will come. I don't know when I hope it's, you know, in the, in the near ish future, but, uh, yeah, I think there's, I think our foot protocol will be a powerful document to just help raise the bar in terms of awareness. And I think when the bar gets raised in awareness, then there is actually an incentive, a consumer driven incentive to create products that align with foot health. So I'm yeah. stoked. I agree. Well, I, when you're done with it, let me let, pull me back in. I'd love to see it. And, and as we like, I, I would love to do this more often whenever I can do anything to help you. And, uh, yeah, cool. I love well, it. Well, to everyone listening, thanks for being here. We will catch you next time. Aaron, thanks again for your time. Thanks, Nick. Thanks cool. for everybody to, uh, for listening too. No worries. Ciao for now, y'all. Thanks for tuning in to the Restore to Explore podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, we'd really appreciate you leaving a review wherever you're listening. That's the best way to support us and to help us reach more people. If you're after more free TFC education or training, looking for any of our TFC tools, natural footwear discounts, or you want specialized guidance on your foot health journey from a trusted TFC health professional, head to thefootcollective.com. All of the important links are in the show notes of the episode.